Welcome back to the Nerd Nest Podcast. It's me, it's Rich, it's just the two of us. Just the two of us, you and just I. Just the two of us. I knew somebody was, <laughs> I knew that either you were going to start singing, which is probably or, better, or I was going to start singing, <laughs> which would have been bad. Uh, it's all but good. Yeah, it, it is. How you been, man? I haven't seen you in a bit. I've been good. I went on vacation. I took a little break. It was fun. It was nice. I'm still wearing tropical clothing, so I'm representing my vacation time. Um, I do I do have an anecdote from my traveling. Oh, let's hear it. Yeah. So I actually share this in my upcoming video, but um, my son and I have both been playing Bellatro like crazy, right? Um, mm -hmm. Also, by the way, I didn't realize there is a mystique about how you pronounce the name of the game. And yeah, nobody the, knows. And nobody the developer knows. refuses to answer that question. <laughs> so, <laughs> is it Bellatro? Is it Balatro? It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's uh, it's whatever you want it to be. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so my son and, and I have been playing like crazy. So we played it the entire flight. And uh, it's about a four hour flight. And he played the ROG Ally. He was using the ROG Ally because in case he wants to play Minecraft specifically, because he's a big Minecraft head. Um, and I played on the Steam Deck OLED and by the time he was out of battery, like he got the first warning, I was down to like 75%. <laughs> so like the battery life is wow. just, and then I gave him like a battery packet. It wasn't a big one. It was 12,000 milliamp hours. Mm -hmm. He got, he, he ran that to the ground and I was, I was down to 57%. So I, I had time, I had time to spare. It seems like the, you know. Uh, that that kind of leads leads into our main discussion today is that the you know th these these devices the Steam Deck specifically because of its low low battery usage um they're just perfect for getting your indie games and and taking them on the go and uh I kind of previewed this in one of my videos and a little live stream where we I, I was talking about the Triple I initiative mm -hmm. and I was talking about the conversation that you and I were having in discord about indies uh but yeah. before we get to that conversation about like what makes an indie an indie let's talk about the devices and like the the steam deck for low power games is crazy good because mm -hmm. it's just such an efficient chip and it's an amd chip like it's made by amd all the other chips in all of these other handhelds with the exception of the msi claw are also made by AMD, but nothing comes close to the Van Gogh chip when it comes to just low power performance. Yep. Is that because like is that because of the chip or is that because of the software and firmware stuff? Yeah, that that's one where I'm I'm probably a little out of my element, right? Like that's one where Carrie and and Kyle would go crazy, but I have to right. imagine it's it it's partly the chip, right? And you know, Valve has said a lot about especially early on, early on about them designing this chip alongside AMD, and I don't mm -hmm. know exactly how much input they had, um but it's clear that it's also clear one thing, you know, one point here is that like no other handheld manufacturers using this and i think that's intentional right like i don't think they're allowed to use this chip right like right? i don't so. think that we see the, the whatever chip that nvidia made for the nintendo switch i don't think that we see that in other hardware do we uh, maybe the nvidia shield but i'm not i'm not positive yeah i'm not sure either um but I, I do, I don't even know if it's an exclusivity contract per se. It might just be that my valve has like first dibs on any new supply, right? Until, mm. until that they just run out of uh, demand for the Steam Deck. And maybe the demand is high enough that they're the only ones that are, that can really buy at scale. And so they get all of the inventory, but it's clear that like, yeah. Asus wouldn't didn't use it. Uh, Lenovo didn't use it, and you know you can they these um, handhelds do have their advantage in the having a higher ceiling, mm -hmm. but uh, they don't have that power efficiency. I remember Kerry got cooked on on Twitter when he said that the Switch OLED um, had like what it delivered in terms of power versus the the original Switch was impressive, right? And it's this like dichotomy that we don't think of power in terms of power efficiency 
And that's what the Switch OLED brings, the the power efficiency, and that's what the Steam Deck and the Steam Deck OLED bring as well as power efficiency and just being able to pump out, like you said, the indie games, certainly the retro games or older games, mm -hmm. um, just being able to do that at a lower TDP and just have longer battery life. Yeah, I think it was um, like a lot of times you get these companies that are like bigger number better. And mm -hmm. it's understandable that they do that bigger number, better thing. And um, it, this isn't really related to gaming, but it's definitely along the same lines. Apple brought out their M series chips and they didn't focus on power. They focused on power per watt is the thing that they kept talking about because right. uh, like you can, you can have a high ceiling on something like the Lenovo Legion Go or the ROG Ally. And that's great if you want to play those more power-hungry games and 100%. you happen to be close to an outlet. But in a handheld device, it is so much more important that you have an efficient chip, which is why when the Nintendo Switch had its first revision, not, I'm not even talking about to the OLED, like yeah. there was an original launch yep. Switch, and then there was another one with a different chip and that different chip had better battery life because it had better power per watt. Yep. You know, it didn't make your games perform better. You could just play them for longer. And th that's the thing that I feel like Nintendo understands and Valve understands. And all of these other companies, they're laptop manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And so they fall into that, um, uh, not brain space, but like the, the this yeah. way of thinking yeah. about bigger number better and they ignore efficiency that was also i mean like i've also had that problem with laptops as well right like i i've had gaming laptops over the course of you know just my life and i have one now that i that my son uses and you can't use it you can't actually use it unplugged like you have to plug it in to actually be able to have any decent performance and, you know, at this point, it's like a, it's a number of years old. It's like four or five years old. Um, the l gaming laptops have gotten better. But my point is that's that's the space we were in before, right? Um, where you literally had to plug in. You could take it with you, but when you actually wanted to play video games, you had to plug it in. Yeah, and, and that makes a lot of sense. Like that is – it is solving a problem in a different way. The problem is – I don't want my stuff to be chained to my desk. I want to be able to take it from one place to the next right, right. and still plug it in. And that makes way more sense for a laptop mm -hmm. than it does for a handheld. Although, yeah. you know, you get a long enough cord, the handheld doesn't really suffer from being plugged in while you're playing it. So I totally get the people that are like, I want to play the latest, the greatest, sure. the AAA games on my handheld plugged into the wall and I don't really care about the battery life. And that's yeah. totally a valid way to play. Yeah. But if you're interested in indies, you know, not just indies, but lower power games, then I think that the steam deck is the way to go. Yeah. But let's talk about those indies. Um, you know, we've got this triple I initiative, which mm -hmm. for, for the, the viewers uh, and listeners who, aren't aware of what this is. Basically, some of the larger indie devs decided, let's get together and make an event. It's happening on April 10th, I believe. And they're going to unveil some games. They're going to have some demos available. There's going to be some shadow drops as well that they've said. It's about 45 minutes of what they say are bangers. And I'm super excited for it. And I know that you, Rich are a huge fan of indie games. Like that is mm -hmm. your jam. Those most of the games that you play are indie. Talk about the triple I initiative, and then we'll get to our conversation about yeah, what yeah. makes indie indie. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about the triple I initiative. I, I like this. Um, so I've always enjoyed like devolver adult swim games, rest in peace, adult swim games. Um, that, that sort of like exactly this, right? Like these putting some, some, amount of money marketing behind the indies that you think will be a bigger hit, like the shovel Knights, um, the hollow Knights, and things like that. Celeste. Right. And so I, I did, it's a very light prediction. I feel confident that hollow Knight silk song will be there because we've, we've seen that it's on, they did the Xbox store page. They did the, the switch. It's been rated in Korea. 
So it does seem like it's going to have like some sort of announcement soon, whether it's release date or something. I think this is the perfect place, um, obviously for visibility, a Nintendo direct or an Xbox showcase would be even better, but I like just selfishly, right. I would love to see that sort of headline this event and make this event even bigger. Yeah, because people would tune into the event for the Hollow Knight stuff. Right. They're the same people that are tuning into Nintendo Directs or Xbox right. developer, whatever they call it, I forget, or a state of play. I don't know yeah. if it's going to be on PlayStation. I assume it will eventually. Um, yeah. But people tune into that. And if you watch those things live and they've got like the chat on the right hand side, the chat is just flying by with thousands of people watching yeah. and they're like, Hollow Knight, Hollow Knight, Silk Song, just Every constantly talking time. about it. Yes, and then they're disappointed when it doesn't happen, even though nobody promised them that it would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I think even the Game Awards, there was chat with like Silk Song there oh, yeah. too. It's every single event. There are people clamoring for it, and you know I'm ready for it too. Now you have played the original, right? I have. I never finished it, so that's a that's that's definitely a wall of shame. Like I'm not big on like shaming the fact that you have games that you haven't finished, but that is a big one because I enjoyed that game. And so I, I do want to see it through. Um, uh, but either way, I'm, I'm, even if I don't, I'm picking up silk song day one. I, okay. So those of you who have played that game, feel free to let us know in the comments down below that like button. If you're watching on YouTube, do you need to play the first one in order to enjoy the second one? Because I also never finished that game. I probably only played it for about a half an hour. Like, it's it's on Game Pass. And it suffers from the same thing that all of my other Game Pass games suffer from. Is that, oh, I'll get to it. Yeah. And so, like, I have it installed on my Xbox. And I just, I played it for a little bit. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I like this. This is this is neat. But then yeah. a new shiny thing distracted me, and I'm like, yeah. "Oh, I'll get back to that later." And I never went back to it. I, so I had I'm other, not with you. I had the other problem we talk about constantly on this podcast, which is I started it on Switch, so I had oh. like a good ten hours on Switch. I was like, "No, I want to play this on Steam." But you know, once I got it on Steam, it just I couldn't like get back to the point I was at, and it just feels a bit like a grind going through it again. Um, but I do want to get back there. Yeah. So, all right, let's, let's have that conversation. And you know, I'm with you on the wall of shame. It's on my wall of shame yeah. as well, yeah. as well as many, many other games. Um, <laughs> we can band we, together on that one. We, we can. Um, but here, here, instead of banding together, let's have an argument for a let's little bit, it. because you and I were having this conversation, not really an argument, but we were having mm -hmm. this conversation and there was a lot of back and forth about what makes an indie game an indie game. And I was yeah. like, this, this is such a fun conversation that I wanted yeah. to do it on the show and record it. So yeah, start us off. Tell, tell me what yes. you think. So this is all born from the question of whether or not Dave the Diver is an indie game. And at the time during like the Game Awards discourse, I was hesitant to jump into that like conversation partially because my thoughts may not have been fully formed, but also partially because some of it got like ugly, right? For no reason whatsoever. This should be, in my opinion, just a fun, dumb discussion, yes. right? <laughs> right? There should be no reason for, for this to be like toxic or anything like that. Uh, but my strongly held but dumb opinion is that Dave Life the Dive... finds a way. <laughs> <laughs> right, life <laughs> finds a way. Sorry, my, go ahead. My strongly held but dumb opinion is that Dave the Diver is an indie game. So, like, here's my thought. Uh, first of all, I think, you know, and I think you agree with this, that language is a living thing. Words me take different meaning over a different time. And also, I think, like, taxonomy is a really tricky thing. And sometimes I'm like a little bit nihilistic about taxonomy. Like there's no way to properly define what a Metroidvania is, right? Like you will, right. you can try to define it and then you'll find an example that sort of defies that explanation or that definition. Right. There, there are two like common, um, I guess philosophy, like armchair philosophy, uh, things that come to mind. One of them is the chair problem. Like how do you define a chair? Is, is it, some people will say it has four legs. Some people will say, but like most of those definitions, you, 
will not match a beanbag. Is a beanbag a chair? Some of those definitions won't match a stool, but a stool is definitely a chair, right? Right. So it's this, this is the hot dog sandwich conversation, right? That's there. the second one, right? Yeah. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Um, <laughs> and so like the chair problem specific, specifically is just like, can you sit on it? That's what most people, def- like a tree stump, is that a chair? Most people will say you can sit on it. That's a chair, right? And so that's kind of where I'm at with indies, where I don't think you can define it by budget. You can sometimes have a high budget indie and triple I initiative is about higher budget indie. Can you have $300 million budget indie? No, I don't think so, but I'll tell you why. I'm going to, I'm going to jump in there real quick. Um, You know, you talk about the triple I initiative and you said high budget indies. We don't necessarily know that these are high budget indies. These are, these are companies that have made their mark already. And they are, not necessarily big budget, you know what I mean? But they mm-hmm. are big in name recognition. Like, we know who Motion Twin is. Like, we are aware of them. It's not like this little tiny company where you're like, oh, I don't know. What else? What other games have they made? You know what I mean? Yeah. And you talk about budget as, uh, like, it, when indie as a term came out that's what it was based on was budget. My argument about Dave, the diver being an indie game is because it feels like an indie game to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm unaware of their budget. Yeah. And is like, that's the thing that I feel like is more important is that does it feel like an indie game? And that's way harder to nail down. Yeah. What were you going to say? Um, by the way, I guess we should mention that the reason a lot of people push back on Dave the Diver being indie is because it's not made by an independent studio, right? It's yeah. made by not Nexon, but the other one, Netties. No, it is Nexon, right? Nexon. Mm, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's Nexon um, Publishing, which is a humongous publisher. Like we, a lot of people don't, and, and on our side of the globe, don't know the name, but they are a humongous publisher. So yeah, that's why you're, of, you're not wrong. It is Nexon. Cool. Um, so yeah. And there, even outside of, um, triple I initiatives, there are arguably high budget indies. So for example, I'm going to give it some examples. I just looked up Kina, the bridge of spirits, right. Is, mm-hmm. is $1 million budget apparently, which is very low compared to triple A games, but not a small budget for an independent studio. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I'm just looking here there. They included star citizen, right? Which is apparently a $600 million uh, budget. Uh, is it star? <laughs> well, citizen? Yeah. It's yeah, been star in C- development for what? 40, 48 years or something. Correct. <laughs> Correct. I think that example on its own, is going to be very controversial, but nonetheless, you could argue it has a $600 million budget. They're independently funded, so to speak. Um, so yeah. So I think budget's out the window when you define an ND. I think whether or not you have ownership above you may also be out of the window. And I think that's the thing that people stick to, right? The reason I find it out of the window is because like you can have partnerships with publishers, right? So there are um, the developers of Crypto, the Necro Dancer. Mm -hmm. They made the, the Hyrule game, Cadence of Hyrule. Is that an independent game? They're definitely an independent publisher they, but, a, or a uh, developer, studio, but right. yeah, studio. But right. I mean, that was published by Nintendo. So right. uh, super tricky. Yeah, that it is super tricky. Yeah. And it, like, there's, there's also the point that does it really matter? It doesn't really matter, Mm-mm. which Mm-mm. is why I like to go back to that feel. I, it's like, um, I, I don't remember who said it. It was like a, it was a, a congressional hearing or something and they were talking about pornography and the guy goes <laughs> yes. i don't know what porn is but yes. i know what it is when i see it yes and that's exactly. that's how i feel about indie games <laughs> i agree I <laughs> sorry agree. indie developers <laughs> i i know what indie is mm-hmm. when i see it <laughs> that's right yeah so yeah the porn um def- like the porn test is one of those the duck test is the other you know walks like a duck quacks like a duck <laughs> right you know, that's how you yeah exactly um so anyway, I think 
for me, what ends up defining indie is how creative it is. And so like I made how, let me change that. How I say that, not how creative it is, how, how much creative freedom it has as in the, in the process of development. And so I made, um, a chart just for you. Cause you're I, like, I love charts. <laughs> so here it is, right? Um, the, is that this QWAP on the, on the top that's, left? That's QWAP. That is cool. Okay. So yes. just real quick, I'm going to describe this for yeah, the audio yeah, yeah. listeners. Go for We've it. We've got uh, the x-axis of our graph is uh, budget. Yes. The y-axis is creativity. You've got QWAP, which you mm -hmm. call it QWAP. I always said QWAP. I Q call it QWAP. Yeah. Okay. You got QWAP uh, on the top left, meaning lots of creativity, not a whole lot of budget. And then you got Precisely. Modern Warfare 2 yeah. uh, is the opposite of that. Go ahead. Yeah. So, by the way, do you know Quop? The same developer as Getting Over It, same developer as Baby Steps that is coming out soon. Bennett Foddy. I, I, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, <laughs> these are all titles that I could, I would never play. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I really enjoy, um, get, I enjoy all of his stuff, but I enjoy uh -huh. Getting Over It a ton. Okay. So the other thing I have here on this graph is like a purple line, right? Like connecting um, Quop to Modern Warfare. So at the end of one is Quop, and at the end of the other is Modern Warfare. And it goes, um, it's basically a, a inverse proportion of creativity to budget, right? Which means that line is sort of the more budget you get, the less freedom for creativity you have. And that is not always the case, but it's a good, I think, heuristic, right? Like the bigger your the bigger the budget for your game, the less like opportunity you have to take chances to be really novel. That doesn't always play out. There are exceptions to that. And so, but I think like you can you can pretty much see that, right? Like GTA 5 or GTA 6 is going to be not nearly as creative as baby steps, I think is, is the good <laughs> right. example, right? Um, it's you, you know what to expect more from GTA six than you do from baby steps. So that's where I, so like, these are some exceptions, right? So I think death stranding to me is sort of above this line where it, it punches above its weight in terms of creativity. The budget is higher than a typical indie. It's probably in the, in the triple a bracket. But it's really creative when you compare it to GTAs and Call of Duties, and then yeah, I can see that. And then what's the what's the game that you've got a little less creativity and a little less budget? Yeah, this one was tougher for me to pick, but this is Hotline Miami too. So this is a oh, game okay. that almost undoubtedly most people will call indie, but I would say just in just by way of being a sequel and sort of an unimaginative sweet sequel to that, right? Like. It's not that creative um, when you compare it to Hotline Miami one. And to that extent, it feels like it was made as a bit of not an obligation, but like, you know, people wanted more Hotline Miami. So in making mm -hmm. Hotline Miami 2, you sort of have to adhere to that. And to be fair, Hotline Miami 2 does, there are ways in which it subverts the expectations and I'm not going to talk about that but you know generally speaking the gameplay is pretty much the same as it was the first time around you know i'm gonna throw a game on here that i think has a lot of creativity i have no idea where it would plot because i don't know the budget of this game yeah but the dlc for shovel knight for the if you have never played the the dlc for shovel knight it's new characters so they have mm -hmm. specter knight plague knight king knight yeah and all three of them play differently and because all three of them play differently, as you play through the campaign with those characters, Yacht Club had to redesign yeah. every level so that those characters could do could could play the game in that different way. And I feel like that was very very creative, uh, a, a very creative endeavor. Absolutely, but it was only there because they were supported by their. Uh, what's it called when uh, f fan They're, funding there? Yeah. They were oh, supported yeah, the by their, their fan funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Their crowdsourcing. Um, and it was like their stretch goals or whatever was that yeah. they would add in these other characters, which is just crazy to me yeah. the way, the, the way that they ended up doing that. Yeah. 
all of that was so novel. And like, you can see that too, in the sense that like, sometimes at least for me, and this is subjective, but like, sometimes it really worked and then sometimes it didn't. And that was okay. Right. Like I forget mm-hmm. which one I didn't enjoy. I don't know if it was the, um, poison one or something, but like, you know, some of those night, um, different nights were, were a lot more enjoyable than some of the other ones. And I think that was just them like, you know, trying something new. And like I said, sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. All right. So with indie, right? Well, before we get to indie, triple a is pretty easily easy to define it's objective. And this is it here where it's like above some budget threshold. I don't know if that's 300 million, 100 million, 500 million, but above some budget threshold is basically where people are calling what people are calling triple a games. Um, and to me, that's sort of what indie is above some creative threshold is what indie is. So whether, so I think Dave, the diver would be somewhere above this because it is a novel game. Uh, just because it was, despite the fact that it was funded by a big publisher, by the way, we don't know what the budget is, right? So it may still have been a small right. budget to your point from earlier. Um, but despite the fact that it was funded by a big publisher, this was a publisher that was willing to take a risk on something. And that is the only place where I think maybe defining indie is somewhat important. Like if, because for me, the value in this is that it's an opportunity for me to celebrate these more novel titles, right? So Mm -hmm. the fact that we can focus on novelty or creativity as like the axis, I think is like when AAA publishers like Ubisoft makes a game like Grow Home, I can now celebrate that. Um, And I'm going to celebrate it regardless, but I think this list lends to my celebration. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. This, uh, this, for the audio listeners on the graph, he has like this horizontal line along the Y axis. And if you're above that horizontal line, then you are considered an indie game. And again, this graph has no numbers on it. So we don't, yeah, it's <laughs> intentionally. So you can't point to an indie game and say that's indie because they spent this much money on it, or that's indie because it's this amount of creativity. It's just, this is an indie game because I think it's an indie game. And to every single person, that's going to be a different um, bullseye. It's a different target that people look at. And so you have this discussion about whether or not something is indie. And if it's backed by, like, you can have an indie studio, like the, uh, whichever one we were talking about before, I've forgotten now. Yeah. You can have that indie answer studio. Yeah, I don't know exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, you can have that studio and then they can make something really cool. And then a publisher can say, oh, you know what? You guys made this cool thing. We will publish it for you. Take care of all of the marketing stuff. And then you guys are all set with your game. And that's an important thing that needs to continue to happen. And I think it's, it's one of the, one of the good things that these big companies can do is find indies and give them a chance because which is what triple I is trying to do mm-hmm. right now. They're trying to find a way to show off a bunch of indie games that may not have these big publishers behind them. Yep. Uh, anything else on the graph? No, but um, no, I'll stop sharing too. But like what you were just saying and what, you know, we were talking about with um, cadence of Hyrule, that's sort of a good segue into the next, uh, into the other topic that we were going to talk about. Um, I, I've forgotten what you're, uh, dead cells developer releasing oh, okay. or working on a new Prince of Persia. Yeah. Before we talk about that, mm-hmm. that is a good, a, a good segue. We are recording this live and I shared the link out with patrons and with, uh, YouTube channel members. Uh, and we, we've got somebody in here, Coda Kodiak. He says, I asked him, what, what do you think of an indie game? And he says, oh, a game that isn't created by bigger established studios. So for examples, for example, Hades has an amazing creativity and is probably just on the boundary of on the budget side, 
But I guess that's just my opinion of it. And that's, again, opinion. It's super this valid. This really is super, super important is everybody has their own opinion on it. Um, I hear your keyboard clicking. Are you looking up the budget for Hades you, or something? I was. I don't know if I'm <laughs> going to be able to find it, but I really want to know. And, you know, to that point, what is the budget of um, Hades 2, right? Because they've, right. they've been the studio that has consistently been able to make uh, a success that usually was bigger than their last one. I think Pyre was probably one that wasn't as big as as whatever came previous. But, you know, they came with Bastion, Transistor, um, and then I forgot what other ones, Pyre but then Hades just blew all of those out of the water. And I think Hades too, I mean, I'm sure that has at least, um, at least a $1 million budget, I'd imagine. Yeah, and um, according to Kodiak in chat, he says Hades had an investment by Epic, if memory serves, during early access. So yeah, they did good, have some money behind them. That's a good point, right? Like I do consider any of those exclusivity deals, like whether it's Game Pass, Epic Game Store, I, I always consider those as as I mean, it's funding, right? So yeah, just like crowdfunding, it's an opportunity usually for that developer to potentially do something that they weren't going to be able to do because they got, you know, another $10 million or $500,000, whatever it is. Yeah. Same with satisfactory. That's true. Yeah, and you know what else is it? I don't want to get distracted because, you know, you brought up the dead cells thing. So I do want to get back to that, but mm -hmm. I read a story about somebody was interviewing at somebody at GDC and basically they were saying, you know, we used to be able to get, it, it, there were more deals out there yeah. to get your indie game on game pass. There were more deals out there to get uh, some exclusivity onto the Epic game store. Yeah. And currently those deals seem to have dried up. They're not really around as much anymore, yeah. almost like Microsoft and Epic Game Store have looked at those expenses and said, "Is it is it giving us a return on our ex, on our investment by doing these exclusivity deals and giving away all these games? Who knows?" Yeah. Uh, it, and that's just an interesting thing. Yeah, I think what happens with a lot of these things, and Steam to an extent is included in this as well, is that the indie developers or the indie games are usually like the on-ramp, right? So like mm -hmm. you, you start, you start with an indie developer, you start with indie games, hopefully you have some hits that gives you some cachet. And now you can negotiate with like the AAA publishers and Ubisoft and right. things like that to get their games in your subscription or, or stuff like that. And that happened to an extent, like I said, with valve where like for a long time, steam was carried in my opinion by indie games. So like, Oh yeah. That first, 10 years, like 2003 to 2013, like AAA publishers were very hesitant to publish their games on Steam. And and this was happening at the same time as sort of the XBLA explosion, right? And so indie games really were a reason to be on Steam. You can get them affordably. You can have a good time. And I think Valve still, like Steam Next Fest, right? Like they still really cater to, to indie developers. So... They're they're one of the best in this in, in this way, I think. Um, but they do give these sort of sweetheart deals to the AAA publishers that that bring in a lot of money. Once you start bringing in, I think it's over ten million dollars in revenue, maybe a hundred million dollars. I don't know. Don't quote me. But once you bring in a certain amount of revenue, you get a lower, um, you get charged a lower fee by Valve. Yeah. Yeah. And, and honestly, that makes a ton of sense. And that's that's a recent development, right? Like that wasn't something that they'd been doing for a while. Yeah, I want to say last five years, like around the time Epic Game Store became a thing, like right before right. that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, no. Yeah. So I think that that's absolutely something uh, to uh, to consider as well. Um, yeah. But you know what? Back to the perfect segue that I ruined because <laughs> I, I, I couldn't pay attention uh, to stuff. But uh, it, we've got uh, an exclusive over at Insider Gaming. This is from Tom Henderson. Uh, who's very, very reliable stuff. And I'm trying to put it on screen right now uh, for the video listeners, video listeners, for the people watching over on YouTube. <laughs> um, exclusive Dead Cells developer to, that's Motion Twin, by the way, to release right. a new Prince of Persia game in Steam Early Access. So first off, there was like, there was just a new Prince of Persia game, like what, 
three months ago? Like, isn't that when that one came out? The yep. the one that just released Lost King, Kingdom or something? Yep. Right. And now we've got a new one made by Motion Twin who... Lost Crown. Sorry. That was Lost the Crown. Not, yeah. not Lost. Yeah. Um, oh, was, uh, Kodiak in chat is yeah, saying it's so actually not Motion this. Twin. It's Evil Empire. Yeah. So I was going to mention this. There's, a, there's actually... I think a lot of people don't know. There's actually a lot of drama at Motion Twin. Well, we're probably past the drama now, but like most, uh, some people defected from Motion Twin to form their own studio. I don't remember which is oh. which, but I guess Motion Twin were the ones that were going to continue making Dead Cells content. Um, but anyway, I guess some of those folks created the evil, uh, the studio <laughs> named Evil Empire, and they're the ones that are going to be, um, you know, slated for this game. Right, and Evil Empire, I'm pretty sure that they are part of the Triple I initiative, right? That sounds correct. I don't like know. I feel like I was reading a story about it and they were being interviewed and it was one of the one of the people from Evil Empire had a quote about the Triple I initiative and why they were doing it. Uh so I would expect yeah. that we're gonna find out more about this in well, we're recording this on Sunday, uh so Sorry. probably on the tenth. And uh, when when we see that and we'll so, OK, it's Evil Empire, not Motion Twin. Um, so my my apologies for screwing that up. But we've got this new Prince of Persia game coming in, coming yep. to Steam Early Access. Let's let's answer this question. Is this indie? Because Evil Empire, <laughs> that's an indie. That's an indie. Like, that's a small studio. I, but I do it's have back, an answer. This for is that. being backed by ubisoft right yeah yeah i do have i do have an answer for that but it's not a yes it's not a yes or a no it's not binary is is it's a it's a it's a prompt is Baldur's gate 3 indie <laughs> that, that's so hard to <laughs> like i don't know how much money yeah that was I, again we can't define it by budget but part yeah. of my brain goes that direction yeah how much money did wizards of the coast throw uh, at Larian Studios to help support the development of this game. So if I go back to my way of thinking, right, which is not the money, but instead the creative freedom, how much creative freedom did Larian Soft have to make Baldur's Gate 3? And obviously we don't know the answer to that, but also obviously that freedom is not infinite because we're working with an IP, Right. So not, that, not just an IP, but an IP with very exactly. specific rules. Exactly. And they had to follow those rules. Exactly. Otherwise, it's not Dungeons and Dragons. Exactly. So I personally do not, and everybody is subject to their own opinion, but I personally do not consider Baldur's Gate 3 indie. And that is because of the limited creative freedom. Um, I, I know people are going to argue that in the comments, but that, that's right. my take. I'm looking forward to reading the comments on this <laughs> one. It's going to be fun. I know. Um, um, so with this, I, I, I think that this follows some of the same logic. I think they'll have more creative freedom in terms of a Prince of Persia game. That is a lot more open in, in some ways than maybe Dungeons and Dragons. I know a lot of people were upset that you don't play as the Prince in this Prince of Persia game. So I guess. Wait, in know, the new one? Yeah. You don't play as the Prince. You play basically as one of his bodyguards. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I, as, as I've played multiple Prince of Persia games, I don't know that I've ever given a damn about who my character <laughs> is. Me neither. Like I go into a dungeon and hopefully I don't fall onto some spikes yeah. um, <laughs> going all yeah. the way back to the original one way back in the day. Yeah. Um, uh, what do you Kodiak, think? Is this, is this indie? Oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, this one? Yeah. Prince of Persia, uh, the Prince of Persia by Dead Cells uh, developer evil it's empire. so hard to say i know that they're an evil or evil god damn i know that they're first off don't name your company evil they right? know you gotta understand let me read you one of the, they did this on purpose clearly let me read you one of the sentences it says <laughs> okay it's understood that the game has been in development for the past four years and happened thanks to a discussion between evil empire and ubisoft at gdc around 2019 soon after evil empire was born like every sentence is just made better by the fact that their name is Evil Empire. <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah. Um, 
So are they indie? It's so hard for me to say yes because they've got the backing of of mm. Ubisoft. I feel yeah. like you know you look at the 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 graph that you made. I'm gonna guess that the creative freedom is pretty limited. Like they make the game, they probably submit it to Ubisoft. Ubisoft says change these 87 things, and you know they're restricting it because they have access to the purse strings. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, Cody X in the chat, like an indie studio, but not an indie game. That's that is tricky. But yeah, I don't know where we draw the line, but this is where I am drawing my line. It's creative freedom. It's a little fuzzy, but that's where I'm going with it. So did you answer about this game? I know I didn't. I'll, I'll say I'll say it depends. But my gut feeling is it's not indie. If I have to give it a yes or no, it's not indie because of the limited freedom. And would you say the same thing about Cadence of Hyrule? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Absolutely. this feels like a Cadence of Hyrule situation. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. So. I would agree with that. Which, um, by the way, I do. Yeah. Even going back to like what I said, do, do we want more of this? I absolutely want so much more of this. Like, yeah, I want more independent developers being tapped for established IP. And I think like to me, it's sort of unquestionable that it makes for good games and it sort of offsets some of the um, risk. It mitigates some of the risk for the publisher because when they are like Nintendo has been doing this pretty consistently with Cadence of Hyrule and just off outsourcing um, some games to other developers. The new it, Peach game. Yeah, the new Peach game. Exactly. Um, they had Platinum Studios in their kind of back pocket for a while. Mm -hmm. It just it means that your studios are not tied up on the games that you think are riskier because they, they don't have this, like the Metroid games, right? Like they don't, they're obviously a very important IP to Nintendo, but they also know that it's not going to have the ceiling and sales that a Mario or any other Mario, you know, Mario, um, Animal Crossing and Pokemon, right? Like those are probably the three big ones. Yeah. And you wouldn't consider let's let's look at metroid prime 4 yeah being made by retro studios mm -hmm. for nintendo nintendo tried to make it themselves they said oh this sucks yeah. uh let's get retro studios to do it and throw everything in the garbage and start over yeah is that indie because nintendo's not making it i feel like the answer is no for me yeah, I think the answer is no. I don't know. I also don't know is isn't retro partially owned by nintendo Mm, that I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to look it up. Um, but even if they weren't, yeah, it's st I still don't think it's indie. I think yeah. Nintendo has a very, I, I think with Metroid prime that there was a lot of creative freedom, clearly the original Metroid prime. Um, but at the same time there was, there were, you know, there was heavy oversight from the, I think Japanese headquarters. Yeah. I think that I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, but regardless, this is a, a super fun conversation about what makes an indie game. So here's my question to everybody who's watching this. Leave a comment down below that like button with a game that you think is not an indie game, but is made by an indie studio. Like, I would love to see more examples of that. Perfect examples would be Cadence of Hyrule, this new uh, Prince of Persia game, that kind of stuff. I'm yeah. curious about what you all think about that. Um, let's move on and talk about something that is n not indie, but super, super important. Um, we've got this uh, article uh, that I just got a pop-up blocker for from Windows Central. Mm -hmm. And the article says that uh, Xbox president Sarah Bond uh, has set up a new team dedicated to game preservation and forward compatibility. Uh, this is awesome to hear. They said the, co the backward compatibility program will continue to future Xbox hardware. So they're coming right out and saying, in the future, whatever you, whatever you buy for Xbox is going to be on your next Xbox as well. And it will continue to move forward. And that's something that no... No console maker has ever really committed to. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, we've had consoles that have had backwards compatibility, but we never had console makers come out and say, 
we're going to do this. And that's one of the things about like PC that is so compelling yeah. is the fact that you have the, you have, you know, that your next computer is still going to be able to play these games, no yeah. matter what that computer is. I mean, unless you buy a Mac, uh, no matter what computer you end up buying, it's going to be able to play these games and you, ha you, so you always be, are able to bring your library forward. And, you know, they're saying we're going to, we're going to continue to do this. And that's something that I am always concerned with when it comes to uh, backwards compatibility and game preservation. I love that they are coming out and saying this. What are your thoughts on that, Rich? Yeah, I love it too. I, I have like, what's weird to me about this quote or this um, statement is that I didn't know, I didn't know they needed a team for this. And I don't want to trivialize because like a lot of people do a lot of important work. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But what I mean is they seem to have figured out like, em um, not emulation, but backwards compatibility for the existing legacy systems. Right. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, they have some games that are not compatible, things like that, but they seem to have figured it out. They have a large um, library of compatible games and they, pretty much stopped working on legacy systems. So this statement seems like a commitment to, like you said, keep um, backwards compatibility working t in the future, which if they're using, if they're continuing to use x86 architecture, I wonder why they need, feel the need to say that we will be committed to this because if they're using x86 architecture, that should be fairly trivial, right? Like PS4 to PS5, backwards compatible, no question. So I don't, I'm not saying that this means that they're working on something else. I just wonder what challenges they have ahead of them for backwards compatibility that they feel like they need a, a larger team or, or some team that is specifically dedicated to this. Yeah. Uh, as far, I mean, cause you're thinking that the team is there to port stuff, right? <laughs> That's a good point. I don't know. I wonder right. if maybe right. it's, yeah, maybe yeah. that's but not that's the, like, maybe that's not the case. Maybe it's something else. Well, there's a quote uh, here in the article, and uh, here's what she says: We formed a new team dedicated to game preservation. Important to all of us at Xbox and the industry itself, we are building on a strong history of delivering backwards compatibility to our players, and remain committed to bringing forward an amazing library of Xbox games for future generations of players to enjoy. And here, here's what I'm thinking. You know, they said that they formed a team. That doesn't mean that that's the only thing that those people do. Like sure. yeah. when I, I, like, for instance, um, the school that I work at is right in the path of the eclipse. So there were people who were getting together and talking about what were we going to do for the eclipse, that kind of thing. In addition to that, I also have, like my real job, you know, I have that stuff going on. So I'm sure that there's right, people right. who are working at Xbox yeah. who also have like their real jobs, but they're also right. on the game preservation task for task force right, or I whatever. Like strike force kind of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> strike force. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It exactly. only counts if you say it like that. <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> so, I love that they're doing this. Mm -hmm. Is it necessary if they're maintaining the same architecture? I mean, up until now, every uh, up until this generation, I feel like every new generation there was a new architecture that you had to yeah, figure out. But now these these consoles are they're just computers essentially. Like they're yeah. very very streamlined computers. They don't have all the crazy stuff like the what was the PS3 that made it really oh, hard cell, to work with the cell, yeah, the architecture. cell processor or whatever. Like yeah. they, they, like this is, this is basically off the shelf components that yeah. they're not really, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. And because say, of that, it makes it easier to keep this backwards compatibility or forward compatibility going. Right. I will say if I were to speculate, right? Like they, Microsoft has been, especially now with Apple and M1, Microsoft has been heavily flirting with arm and so it's possible that we see a future Xbox with sort of an ARM architecture. And if that's the case, that would be huge if they are working on some sort of x86 to ARM 
translation specifically for right. Xbox, right? So maybe it wouldn't be open source like Proton is, but even if they are working on that, that would be huge. It would be huge. Um, yeah. You know, Apple did that with yep. Rosetta to in order to switch from first from their power PC chips to Intel and then from Intel to the M1 chips. Valve is doing the same thing with the Steam Deck with Proton and, you know, Microsoft doing this with their their promised next generational leap that yeah. we're supposed to be seeing sometime this year, whether or not it comes out this year, but something that they're going to show off this year. Yeah. Uh, all of that stuff is things that they keep saying. But I love that they're committing to forward compatibility. Um, part of me thinks that, you know, that it could just be, I mean, not saying that they're lying, but it could be just be like, hey, this is our way of marketing. Buy yeah. your games on Xbox because they're going to be on your future Xbox as well. Yeah. And a lot of, go ahead. Sorry. A lot of their marketing points right now, it seems like they're they're really going towards being a PC, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the lines are blurring everywhere. So like with Valve making the Steam Deck, I feel like the lines got blurred. But everything that Microsoft has been saying recently – it feels like they're blurring those lines, whether it's Epic Game Store or other stores. They didn't say Epic Game Store specifically, but they said stores coming to Xbox. No, they did say Epic Game Stores. I, okay, the only I'll, one that they didn't say was Steam. Did they actually say Epic Game Store and Itch.io? Um, I, okay, I the, know. That was the way The Verge put it, put it forth, but I wasn't sure. Well, now I'm not positive, but <laughs> like my, my memory tells me that they said Epic Game Store but that could have just been the way that the article was written. And either way, right? Like Epic Game Store is the obvious choice given sort of Epic's crusade currently, right? So like mm -hmm. clearly if Microsoft were to open things up in any way, Tim Sweeney's going to he's going to be the first one through that door. Um, right. So Well, it, okay, it, let's let's take a second because you posted something in our Discord this morning about mm -hmm about the other stores on xbox you want to you want to bring yeah. that up yeah and this is this is just a, a stray thought right like it was like hmm makes you think so i haven't thought it through too much <laughs> through too much but i said i'm trying to find it specifically exactly what i said uh i said it's funny there's so much pushback to the idea that xbox is flirting with the idea of having other storefronts like i've seen people say how could they afford that but Outside of that, people find it completely obvious that Valve is going to sell enough Steam games such that they can afford selling the Steam decks either at a loss or some loss or some sort of subsidized cost where the, the margins are razor thin. Like we all take for granted that, sure, Valve can sell whole ass PCs, part of my language. They can sell whole PCs basically that, that where you can, you know, use Epic Game Store, GOG, Itch.io, whatever. And they'll make enough profit, but for some reason for Microsoft, it's, it's brought into question whether or not they're going to make enough money. I have my thoughts on that, but it, it's, yeah, I'll, I can speak to them, but it's not fully formed yet. Well, okay. So first off for the steam deck, um, mm -hmm. there's no easy way. Uh, yeah. There's desktop mode. You could do whatever the hell you want there, but yeah. there's no easy way to get to the other stores mm -hmm. and all but the hardcore users are they're just going to boot it up in steam and just buy their games from steam. So yeah. I, I don't see the steam deck as somebody, I, I don't see people using that with other stores as like their primary way of doing things. But if the Xbox suddenly had the Epic game store on there and you got weirdos like me who not well not like me because I, I stopped doing it but at first I had an alarm that would go off every month to remind me hop on the epic game store and get your free stuff or every week or whenever it was I can't remember now but you would just get all this free stuff and all that stuff is like attached to my account if suddenly I have access to all of that stuff on my xbox I'm going to spend a whole lot less money on the xbox store if, At the same if time, it's as game, seamless as it is on Xbox, yes, like a, it has yeah. to be seamless. If it's right, if it's a, if it's like a huge workaround where like you got to buy it from another store and then like 
like when Apple, if you wanted to like subscribe to somebody on Twitch or whatever, you had to like buy a coin or something like that kind of extra currency, too much of a pain, then people just won't do it. But if you also right. look at the Xbox, people aren't buying games on Xbox. They just play Game Pass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't. So I, like I said, I just this was just a stray that I shot. So I haven't thought yeah. it through too much. Um, but uh, but it's fun. It, it is. It's fun. And I just do. Do you think that if um, let's say let's say it was it was you had to jump through a few hurdles, not like monetarily, but just like, you know, it becomes a little more PC like when let's say Steam is going would be on xbox but it becomes a little more pc like where you have to go to like a desktop sort of mode you have to like download you know steam and then it doesn't have the convenience of the xbox games would you use that i certainly would absolutely in fact on my steam deck i never ever buy anything from the steam deck i always use my phone i yeah. load up my I, I go into my phone or or my computer um but I go into the store on my phone or on the computer and I buy it that way because the the Steam store on the Steam Deck chugs. Like it's just kind of slow. Yeah. And it's not fun to use. Like if I'm searching through stuff and I hit the back button, it doesn't go back to where I was just looking. It That's goes true. back and then scrolls up to the top or something. And then I'm yeah. like, come on, this is terrible. <laughs> it's a bad, it is a yeah. bad experience. And I'm not a fan of that. So if I would go on my phone and buy a game on steam and then on my Xbox, I could launch that game. Absolutely. I yeah. would use that a, a, a thousand percent because I would buy all of my games from steam because if I can buy them all from Steam, then I can use them on my computer. I can use them on my Xbox. I can use them on my Steam Deck, on my Ally, on my Legion Go. I can use them yeah. on everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that Microsoft has to, I think, you know, why Microsoft would do this. Um, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know what Valve is going to do, but I think Microsoft has to consider the fact that maybe Valve will release some sort of set-top box maybe one day it'll be available in retail shelves and what would what would that look like in terms of being competition to Xbox right you have something where you can just easily download a steam game play a steam game and it and it may be in competition just in terms of performance with an Xbox and so like how can microsoft beat that 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 seems like it would be a tough thing to, for them to beat yeah i think so i i yeah. absolutely think so but um, I think, as Kerry said in the chat, that um, he said something <laughs> along the lines of Microsoft could lose two billion, two trillion dollars, and and still have two trillion dollars or something like that. So <laughs> yeah, he said lose two trillion and still have one trillion, and yeah, yeah. They, Microsoft can afford to do whatever Microsoft wants to do at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely, so, no question. Um, uh, all right, let's uh, let's move on and talk about uh, you know in related to what Sarah Bond said about preserving games. There's this um, new initiative called the stop killing games campaign, which I love the idea of this. And I'm just going to throw it up on screen. Uh, basically uh, this is from PC gamers says gamers seek legal win that would stop developers from rendering online games unplayable and it's an assault on consumer rights and the preservation of media. Yeah. In short, basically the idea behind stop killing games is if you're going to shut down a game that requires online play, or you have to have servers in order to play it, then you need to give the players access. This is something we've talked about a million times. Yeah. You got to give them a way to duplicate that experience before you shut it down so the people who spent money on it can continue to use the thing that they spent money on yep. um the perfect example for this is marvel heroes marvel heroes was this awesome diablo clone that was an mmo where you would play as marvel characters and then when disney bought marvel they shut it down and said it's all gone now and there were people who had 
hundreds of hours into that game and they poured tons of money. Now, luckily, Disney's deep pockets allowed them to give everybody refunds, which is great. But that's not always something that happens. You know, you look at other games like Asheron's Call 2. This was this really cool game. It was a sequel to one of my favorite MMOs ever. I played it. It wasn't amazing, uh, but people didn't stick with it, and so it ended up getting shut down, and you cannot play it anymore. I'm sure that there's ways that, ways that you can, like, uh, do it through, like, hacked servers or whatever, but not officially. The only official time when, when this has really happened that I know of off the top of my head would be City of Heroes, where the people who made the game eventually capitulated and said, all right, here's all of the stuff that you need to continue making the uh, your fan version of City of Heroes. And they gave that over, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another game I, I think of when I think of like a graceful shutdown, I'll share my screen here, is Knockout City. So Knockout City is another online only game. Great um, game, by the way. Really good game. Really, really damn good game. Um, and they had to shut down their servers. They couldn't keep it up. But they, you know, I, and I haven't followed up on this, but I assume it's out by now. They they promised to have a private hosted server version so that you can still play the game on a private hosted server. So they would they would release the binaries that you need to still play that game. You would just have to, you know, host a server somewhere. Um, so theoretically, you should still be able to play Knockout City and, you know, they, they did that again, pretty gracefully. And I think that was a nice way of handling it. Um, I also want to point out that, and I'll share my screen again here for another one. If you go to that website, I was really, this is something I was really happy about the stop killing games website, which is a lot of times these sort of like campaigns are just, they just meant exactly just complaints. they just i don't like this yeah just manufacture (laughs) like um discussion but no action and the first thing like the biggest button here on this website is to take action and then from there like you can look at which where which country you're in so if i'm in the united states it tells you like three three actions that you can take and how impactful each of these actions are. So if you want to contact the DGCCRF, which I don't know what that is, they rate that as a medium high priority. So that that would be more impactful than contacting the FTC, which they rate as a low priority. And then they give you the steps to do it, which include, you know, screenshots, where to go, what sort of account to create. Like they really did the legwork of Mm -hmm. making sure that this means something and isn't just generating online debate. Yeah. And I love that there's a, there's a little asterisk on there that says in order to take place or take part of this thing, like if you close that, it says you have to own (laughs) the crew, which is another online game that apparently got shut down due to music licensing, due to car cars, licensing, the licensing ran out, and so the publisher has no choice but to shut down the game, yep. which sucks because the license ran out. And like this is the kind of thing where these licenses should be granted in perpetuity for that game. So the crew, yep. you know, the crew comes out, and you're granted the license to put a Porsche in the game, uh, and that and that game will always have access to that car. But then when you go to make the crew two, you got to make that deal again. Yeah. Or or just, just have a graceful shutdown plan, right? Like if you can't, if you know that you make these licenses may expire and you are not able to get them, then have an option for non, uh, non non-licensed prop, like not properties, but non-licensed versions of those assets, Mm -hmm. whether it's cars, music, whatever. Yeah, I I absolutely replace the Porsche with Mm -hmm. the uh, Corsche or something. I don't know. I just made up a thing. Yeah. Um, Another discussion that I thought would be interesting is I posted this on my YouTube channel. Uh, I said Steam Deck fans. uh, No, not that one. Oh, it's not showing the one that I was looking for. Well, I can mention it real quick. Um, 
Noah from Steam Deck HQ just started a new subreddit, um, which you can find over at reddit.com slash r slash Steam Deck HQ. That is not the post that I thought that I was linking. So (laughs) I got to try and find it. But basically, I was asking, look, we have rumors, not really rumors, because Asus is all but said that they're making an an ROG Ally 2, and it's coming soon. And... One of the things that people complain about with the ROG Ally mm-hmm. is battery life. And another is that they wish that it was a OLED screen. Both perfectly reasonable, you know, things that somebody might bring up. So I said, well, if you had to choose between those two things, like you you could pick only one, would you want it to have a, hopefully this is the, here, let me close that. There we go. Uh, would you want it to have a bigger battery or an OLED screen? And we had uh, um, uh, so over 3,000 votes. 55% said bigger battery. 45% said OLED screen. Where are you landing on this, Rich? It's tough. I'm going to cheat. And I'm, I'm not going to say both. I'm not going to cheat that way. But here's how I'm going to cheat. An OLED screen would help with battery life. It would. <laughs> so so I'm going to go assuming OLED VRR, right? Because here's the thing. The, the ROG Ally screen is really, really nice. really nice, right? Like I don't, I don't miss OLED when I'm using the ROG Ally. It's a beautiful screen. So mm-hmm. I don't need the OLED, but OLED VRR would be really nice and uh, it, it should help with battery life. So I, I, I'm going to, I haven't voted yet, so I'm going to vote right now. OLED screen. Yeah. All right. That's fair. Uh, I think I would prefer to, I would prefer to have better battery life. Yeah. I don't know if a big, like, I know that they said that they wanted to get, when they first announced the first one, they kept, they were harping about the weight. And I just, I don't think that the weight was nearly as much of a, an issue. These, this thing needs a bigger battery. It's if it's going to have a chip by AMD or God forbid, Intel, then it's going to be a power hungry monster that's going to chew through battery. And so you need to have a much bigger battery in there um, or a more efficient chip. Uh, But yeah, Yeah. for me, I would want better battery life over the OLED screen only because the ROG ally screen is so damn good. It's really, really fantastic. Yeah. I'm also thinking about it like, because I, I, battery life would be more impactful to me again than just the screen. Right. Um, Yeah. But if, if again, you could only pick one, which, and I guess this answers the question, just the poll itself. Right. But like, which one would sell, which one would give consumers more reason to pick it up? And that's tough, but I think you put OLED on the box. Exactly. (laughs) And a lot of people are going to reach for that. That's the thing is like, they've seen the, the, the Nintendo switch, and then they saw the Nintendo Switch OLED and they were like, whew, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. We had the Steam Deck LCD and then the Steam Deck OLED, every, like, it's a gorgeous screen. It just looks so mm-hmm. good. And while the ROG Ally screen is really good, putting the those four letters on the box yeah. Yeah. might shift quite a quite a quite a bit more than somebody saying 60 watt hour battery. Or yes. you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Well, I think that that is going to do it for this episode. Uh, Rich, what videos you got coming next, my my man? So I have a video coming where I basically talk about my thoughts on a Steam Deck 2. And a lot of it, I'm going to I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant again before we drop. Uh, Let's hear (laughs) it. I love rants. A lot of it is like, you know, people are looking for an incremental upgrade to the Steam Deck. They're like, I want a little bit more powerful of an APU because I want it now, right? Like that's what people want. People want a Steam Deck 2 now. Some people, not not our audience typically, but just the people that want a more powerful Steam Deck. So a lot of people that, you know, have an RG Ally or something like that. I'm like anybody who wants to push the the gaming envelope, maybe play exactly. Dragon's Dogma 2. You're right. Exactly. Right. And I just don't see it that way. Like I don't it's not that that's not important to me. It's that I want a Steam Deck 2 to be bigger than that, right? And like 
when I think about what I want from a Steam Deck 2, I think a lot of people would say I'm being unrealistic. And then that just makes me think, like, if I told you about the Steam Deck in 2019, like, you would you would throw water at me. Like, you, you would not believe me if I told you that there would be a handheld gaming PC for $400 that plays games, almost your entire Steam library on Linux and can have, you know, three plus hours of battery life. Like, you, you would not believe me if I told you that. When did it get announced? Was it uh, 2021? 2021. Okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you're right. People wouldn't have believed that. Yeah, at all. So yeah, I, I want to be as unrealistic with my like desire for a Steam Deck 2. So that I, I talk about what I what I think the Steam Deck 2 should be. And it's a little okay. out there. I'm looking forward to watching that one. That'll one will be fun. Yeah. Um I just put out a video about uh, emulation on iOS, so you guys can find that over at youtube.com slash nerdnest. You can find Rich's video over at youtube.com slash fan the deck. And uh, this is something I'm really bad at, but I never tell people about the Patreon. If you want to get the podcast without any ads in it, then you can subscribe to the Patreon over. Uh, there'll, there'll be a link in the description down below because I can never remember the URL. Uh, so... Uh, make sure that you check that out if that's something you're interested in. And in the future, if we do these uh, these live recordings, that's where I post where when we're going to do um, uh, a recording where people can come in and watch live and be part of the show like Matt was earlier. Uh, so have an awesome day, everybody. And uh, from the Nerd Nest, stay rad.